Okay, so uh, let me start out by uh, mentioning that my mother certainly played no role in my becoming an atheist. My mother was a, a wonderful woman, uh, a beautiful lady. She had tremendous dignity and class. She, uh, uh, the neighbors loved her. She was a, a registered nurse, and she put in many extra hours at the hospital. Her, she worked in the ward that dealt with dying patients. And when I would come and pick her up late from work at night, all the patients would, not all the patients, but many of the patients would drag me over and talk to me and tell me what a wonderful woman my mother was. When she died, her funeral was packed, and person after person that came up to me had a story to tell about my mother and her goodness. Time and time again, people described her as, Jeff, you know, your mother is a true saint. She was a deeply religious woman, a great mother, a great teacher, a gentle person. She never cursed. I never heard her curse, you know, swore ever in her whole life. Never heard her speak to anybody rudely or speak about anyone rudely. She was a tremendous example of a, of a truly religious person. And she didn't wear it on her sleeve. It was just slowly but surely you could see it just in her day-to-day -day interactions with people. Uh, my father, on the other hand, was a difficult man. Um, my father, <clears throat> for some strange reason, had this tremendous rage inside him. I don't know where he got it. Uh, he had this terrible violence inside him. And every night, he would try to quell that violence with hard, hard drinking. And his drinking, though, only made him all the more volatile. Because my father could be laughing and joking one minute, and he could fly into an angry rampage the next for some unexpected reason. You never know what would trigger it. And once he flew into that angry rampage, it would take, you know, he would just go wild in the house. The house would be in havoc. And he would rage on and on and on, and it would take an awful lot of liquor and several hours before he would finally go to sleep. And this would happen night after night after night. And so my four brothers and I, I was the fourth in line, my four brothers and I lived a frightening and precarious childhood. But I'd have to say the worst of it was watching my father regularly taunt and threaten and abuse my mother. And it would happen day in, day in, day in, day out, night in, night out. And it was a never, never ending nightmare. You see, it's really not so bad when you're the target of your father's violence. You might think it's bad when a child is the target of their father's violence, but it's really not all that bad. Uh, at the moment of attack, you're really not thinking about anything except your own survival. When he's firing punches at you or kicking you on the ground or chasing th you throughout the house, or when he's threatening you, I'm going to hurt you, bad boy, you're not thinking about anything at that moment except escape. While all that's going on, you're not thinking about the aftermath or consequences, the psychological repercussions or anything like that. And when it's all over, you might even excuse the onslaught because you figure maybe you somehow deserved it. If not for what you did this time, maybe for something you did in the past. You could always put the blame on yourself. But a far worse fear is the terror that overcomes you when you watch your father go after your mother because she's the only source of warmth and kindness, of love and protection that you know. And if he were to take that away, from a little boy's standpoint, then you've lost everything. But far worse than the fear is the guilt, and it comes over you from several directions. First of all, there's the guilt that comes at you for, for, uh, upon you from the growing antipathy you have towards your father because we're taught to love and respect our parents, and we are born with this natural bonding attachment to them. But when you watch something like this happen night after night after night, and you, this rage is growing inside you, you're being pulled in opposite directions. Then there's also, of course, the guilt that comes when you think that you might be the cause of this nice, night's violence. Maybe something you said or did that you didn't even realize triggered it. 
Maybe just your father's dislike of you triggered an argument between your mom and him that is now raging on downstairs. But the worst guilt of all, and it is by far the very worst, is knowing that you did nothing to stop your father from hurting your mother. Because while he raged on against your mother downstairs, you hid in your bed and you trembled underneath the covers. Maybe you whimpered and you cried and you put the pillow on your head. And thus, you traded personal respect for personal safety. And with each such incident, you come to realize with ever greater and greater clarity, you come to realize your own weakness, your own impotence, your own incompetence, your own worthlessness, your own cowardice. And the hate grows and festers inside you, not only for the man that you call father, but for yourself as well. It is a terrible, terrible thing to make a young boy choose between his mother and himself. It is extremely unfair. I noticed that tomorrow there's going to be a, a lecture about, tomorrow morning a lecture about spousal abuse uh, given by Dr. Uh, Shaheen um, Riz Rizwan. I hope you'll all attend it. I think it's a very important subject. When I was little, I used to daydream about life without my father. I just wanted the violence to go away. I wanted not to be afraid anymore. I felt like I was trapped in a bad dream and there was no way out. And so I prayed to God again and again and again to take, to remove my father from our lives. But he was always there. And very soon I began to wonder if God really was. I could not fathom why God would subject my mom to such lifelong punishment. Could not imagine what great sin she must have committed or that we, her children, must have committed to deserve my father. I didn't have the maturity to sort out such questions, but I had enough fear and anger to provoke them. I was too young to see the wisdom in allowing my father to, I mean my mom, to suffer the violence and abuse of my father. I was too young to understand why God would let innocent children tremble night after night after night in their beds, fearing that they might not see their mother the next morning. I was too young to see how the mercy of God could even extend to my father with all his terrible failings. All I could see in my world was chaos and violence and fear, and so it became easy for me to question the existence of God, and I began to do that at a very early age. I think I'll even say that the turmoil of the 60s and 70s, that's the age when I was a teenager, in the you know, late 60s, early 70s, only uh, reinforced my skepticism. When John and Robert F. Kennedy were assassinated or Martin Luther King was gunned down, when Vice President Agnew was kicked out of office and Richard Nixon soon after him, when the race riots erupted in city streets like mine and gang fights erupted in our cities, many of those which I was involved in, when I saw the bizarre and senseless carnage of Vietnam, they all confirmed the lesson that was already ingrained in me and that my father had taught me so well, that the world is dominated by random, consuming, undiscriminating violence. And very soon I began to ask why. Why would God make it that way? Why wouldn't he just pop us into heaven from the first and spare us all this suffering? Why does he let little children in Vietnam get napalmed and run down the street naked on fire when they had done nothing to deserve it? You know, why does he let the race riots go on? Why does he let the leaders be assassinated? Why does he just let the violence go on and on and on for people who had nothing to do with it? It wasn't of their own making. Why didn't he just make us angels and pop us into heaven if he could make us angels, which I was always taught he could? <clears throat> Why did he make us so susceptible to sin? Why didn't he make us impervious to it? Like he made the angels. <laughs> Is this the best world he could create, I thought? Is this the most perfect world he could create for our existence, for our beginning? I just couldn't figure it. And all the explanations I received from priests and doctors and lawyers, you know, from whoever you know, spoke to me or taught me, they just didn't make sense to me. In any case, so I became an atheist when I was 16, even though I was going to Catholic school at the time. 
declared myself an atheist in one class. It was a confrontation between me and a priest. We were talking about God and the purpose of life. And I expressed my views, and he said, well, then you don't believe in God. I said, well, I guess I don't. And then through my junior, uh, junior and senior year of high school, I got an F in religion, even though I continued to do very well on the test. 